Hello and welcome to the next round of this TTC Vodcast series. In this Vodcast we have Dr. Kurt Soyuan, who is a research scientist here at EDDC with over a decade of experience in cellular assays. He will be taking us through the key thought processes when designing and optimizing cell-based assays for target validation and subsequent cell-based assays for drug discovery projects. Welcome and thank you for taking the time. Thank you. What is the importance of cellular assays in target validation? Well, we all know that the target validation is extremely crucial in drug discovery. Drugs in development typically failed in the clinical trial due to lack of efficacy or due to toxicity, both of which are often attributed to inadequate preclinical target validation. Cellular assays has been used to evaluate whether manipulating a potential target will have a good therapeutic window or not, which makes them important components in preclinical target validation. Could you elaborate more on this validation process? The target validation process involves the application of a wide range of techniques, including cellular assays. Data generated from these assays using relevant cells as disease models will be analyzed and interpreted carefully to demonstrate whether the manipulation of a target can provide a therapeutic benefit with an acceptable safety window. Only when the target has reached an acceptable level of validation and the disease linkage, the drug discovery project will then move forward to the next stage. What are the commonly used cell-based approaches for target validation? Talking about the target validation in the field of cancer, indeed most of the data are from the cellular assays. Because of the existence of various cancer cell lines as uh, relevant cancer disease models, this helps the researchers to investigate the effects of genetic manipulation and the mechanism of action of a potential target. In terms of the approaches, genetic perturbance of the target is commonly used. We can use RNA interference or CRISPR knockout to test the effects of loss of function. This helps to address whether the target is needed for the disease progression. We can also overexpress target to check the effects of gain of function. This helps to address whether the target is a driver for the disease progression. We can also create truncation or mutation of the target to identify the domains or motifs which are important for its function. To study the effects of the genetic perturbance, the cellular readout will be measured, which includes the cell health, phenotypes, the signaling pathway, downstream protein status, and the gene expression. Another commonly used cellular approach is to measure the expression level of the target. Usually in the publication, you will see the data of expression of genes and proteins in the normal and the disease-derived tissues to demonstrate a link or correlation of the expression with disease progression. Besides genetic manipulation, which is usually done in academic labs, what other strategies can be employed for target validation? Well, the two compounds were also used to demonstrate the druggability of a target by chemical perturbance. Both genetic and chemical perturbance approach are complementary to each other for an adequate target validation. You mentioned two compounds. Could you explain this term? A two compound is simply a selective small molecule modulator of a protein's function that allows the user to ask the mechanistic and the phenotypic questions about its molecular target in biochemical, cell-based or animal studies. An example is an inhibitor that shuts down a specific enzyme when bound which allows you to investigate how the cell behaves when that enzyme is no longer functioning. The requirements are that the two compounds must be potent enough to see the activity and the specific enough that you see only the activity you want and nothing else. Two compounds are often used for target validation as well as reference for developing and performing assays in drug discovery. However, you need to be mindful of some pitfalls on interpretation of data for genetic or chemical perturbance of your target. So what are the potential pitfalls when we interpret the results from the manipulation of the target in cellular assays? A high percentage of the published findings related to preclinical validation of cancer targets are not sufficiently robust to justify moving forward with drug discovery efforts. First, lack of reproducibility 
evidence from one cell line or one resource might be risky to validate a target. The second is lack of robustness. The target only shows the effects in very narrow condition that can be preset in the laboratory, but not the realistic in the real-world conditions such as clinical trials. The third is a causation versus correlation. For example, a protein expression in cancer inversely correlated with survival rate does not mean that the protein is the cause of death. And thus should not be claimed as a valid target by this evidence only. The fourth, gain of signal assay versus loss of signal assay. Effects observed in loss of signal assays might be due to disruption of cell fitness instead of mechanism of action. The last but not the least on target versus off-target effects. Cancer scientists routinely use reagents such as chemicals, SINRAs, SHRAs, and the single guide RNAs to perturb the functions of specific targets in cancer cells. The phenotypes caused by this perturbance can be due to effects on their intended target, which is on target activity, or unintended target, which is off target activity, or it could be some combination of the two. A rescue experiment will help to confirm its on target effects. It appears that during target identification and validation, a lot of assays are being applied. So why do we still need this step of assay development before we start the new drug discovery project? Once the target is validated, the target assessment will be required for the drug discovery project. One important part is to assess the feasibility of the target. It addresses whether this target is druggable and the disruption of this target is measurable. Therefore, the assay that has been used in target validation have to be evaluated on whether they could be used for measuring the disruption. If current assays are just qualitative but not quantitative for a measuring purpose, we need to think of translating the assay to a quantitative one or developing a new assays for that purpose. Both quantitative enzymatic and cellular assays are commonly used for evaluating which drug candidates has better efficacy and safety and thus are critical for the decision on which drug candidates to move forward. Would you like to share some of your experience on the assay development in the past years? Okay, in the past I've been working on the designing robust, relevant and reproducible quantitative cellular assays to support the compounds assessment in heat identification, heat to lead and lead optimization. The assay could be phenotypic or target based However, for a target-based drug discovery project, we prefer to use target-based assays to evaluate the compounds. I had some experience on applying reporter assays in drug discovery, and I'd like to talk a bit more about it. Using reporter to design cellular assay is a popular approach in drug discovery. A reporter gene is a gene that researchers attach to a regulatory sequence or attach in frame to the coding sequence of another gene of interest in cells. Based on where it is attached, it could be in the format of transcriptional reporter and used as an indication of whether certain genes is expressed or a signaling pathway transcription factor is activated. Or it could be in the format of translational reporter, where it could be used as an indication of protein level, cellular localization and the protein-protein interaction of protein of interest. The commonly used reporters include fluorescence protein or luciferase. Here is one case study where we applied transcriptional reporter assay for screening of wind secretion inhibitors. The diagram shows two genetic modified cell lines we use for the reporter assay. STF3A cells was modified from HEC2 nitrate with stable expression of Win3A and the luciferase-based wind beta catenin reporter. This cell line will have a continuous wind production wind pathway activation and the transcription of luciferase. Therefore, any inhibitors targeting the cascade of wind production and activation will be identified. The other cell line, STF, was also modified from HEC to nitrate with stable expression of a luciferase-based wind beta catenin reporter, but not Win3A. An exogenously surprised Win3A condition medium is required to activate the transcription of the reporter. This cell is used to identify inhibitors targeting the downstream mediators of wind pathway instead of those inhibiting wind production and secretion. As you can see here, our porcupine inhibitor in clinical trial, ETC159, 
shows a nice dose response curve in STF 3A assay, but not STF wind condition median assay, demonstrating that it blocks the upstream wind secretion rather than downstream wind activation. The second very useful application of reporter is to fuse it with a protein of interest. The fusion protein can be used to monitor the protein for its activity in protein-protein interaction, change in protein level, compounds target engagement, and the protein localization. Promega has purposely designed a donor acceptor pair, Nanoluck plus Herotech, for bread assay. When Nanoluck fuels protein A binds to Herotech fuels protein B, there is a bread signal from donor to acceptor. And the ratio of acceptor versus donor can be used as indication of the interaction of protein A and B. Another application of translational reporter is for testing a compound's target engagement. Here is a case study where we developed cellular target engagement assay for SO kinase. In HEC293 cells, we changed over express SO nanoluck fusion protein and added fluorescence tracer, which could bind to SO kinase pocket. The bread signal will be generated with addition of the substrate of nanoluck luciferase. When we treat the cells with SO inhibitor, the inhibitor will compete with fluorescence tracer for pocket binding, resulting in the release of tracer from SO and the reduction of bread signal, as seen in the response curve. This was very insightful. So Yuan, thanks again for taking the time. Thank you. And thank you for joining.